So good morning. Good morning. Hello, and thank you for being here today. We want to start by thanking the Navy Child and Youth Programs for making today's webinar possible. Um, and we have a poll for you to take. Um, we'd love to know what, it, thank you for visiting us from Texas. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, we'd love to know what your role is today. Are you a parent, a counselor, an educator, a school liaison, uh, an EFMP professional, or what is your capacity for coming today? Is it another one? And if it's another one, we would appreciate you putting that in the chat box. We'd like to know just who is attending and what role you're attending so we can kind of gear uh, what we're saying toward you. Oh, there, well, that's exciting. <laughs> they never know, right? So we do appreciate that you taking that poll. Um, just like, so you know, we always do welcome professionals who work with our military connected children to our trainings, but I think, because I do think you'll find the information and tips that we present useful, but note that our MSIC parent support webinars have actually been designed with parents as the target audience, and you'll notice that in our verbiage. So before we introduce ourselves, we want to share a little bit more about MSEC and its mission. So MSEC, MSEC, the Military Child Education Coalition, is a nonprofit organization established now over 25 years ago. MSEC's mission is to support all military-connected children by educating, advocating, and collaborating to resolve those educational challenges that are associated with our military lifestyle. In 2005, MSEC formalized supporting and programming for our military-connected parents so that they may be empowered, informed, and proactive in supporting their children's educational journey. So we strive to deliver these informative and hopefully interactive webinars that address academic, social, and emotional issues, um, again, associated with our hectic military family lifestyle. Our vision, M6 vision, is that every military-connected child is college, work, and life ready. Okay, well, I'll tell you, my name is Michelle Brashear. I'm joining you from Madison, Alabama today, Northern Alabama. It looks to be another stormy day. We've had some wicked weather lately. Uh, my husband and I moved 14 times during his almost 30 years of active duty service. Um, we have two wonderful military connected now young adults, both of who were avid readers and experienced many of the benefits that we're going to be discussing today. And because, you know, our family's been there, I really enjoy sharing these workshops with you all. I've been working with MSIC and supporting you all since 2017. Sarah? My name is Sarah Shackleton, and I am joining you from Charleston, South Carolina today. Um, I am the spouse of an active duty Air Force member, and we have three military-connected children. Our oldest is just learning how to read in kindergarten right now, so this was... Um, a very useful webinar for us and our family. Um, we are getting ready for a PCS. Actually, the movers just came yesterday, so they'll take it all the way tomorrow and we'll hit the road on Thursday. Um, I started this role um, as a Charleston community coordinator. I've now joined the webinar team and am working as an educator. Um, I wanna to start today with a couple of administrative announcements. At the end of the webinar, we would like to invite you to take our survey about today's presentation. We appreciate the two to three minutes it'll take to give us your feedback. This is a key method we use to tell our funders what we're doing and it lets us know where we need to tweak things so that we can continue offering you, the um, Military Connected Parent, the very best training opportunities. You'll see a chat box on your screen where you can ask questions during our webinar. Um, you should see now a PDF file in your chat box that states downloadable resources and this contains the resources and information relating to today's webinar. Know that you can always view the recording later if you wanna review the material or experience any technical difficulties during the presentation, and this webinar is being recorded. By the end of this workshop, parents and caregivers will understand the importance of reading during the middle and high school years, even during the summer. They'll be able to recognize how reading habits are changing They'll be able to apply ideas to help inspire teenagers to read in this digital world, especially during summer break, and be able to implement techniques and tips to help their teenagers with school summer reading assignments. So I do have an engagement question for you that you can put in the chat box. What book do you remember reading when you were a child that fascinated you or made you think? 
Again, please share those in the chat box. I'm going to add that right now. Was I can remember when I was in, I think, third grade, um, our teacher read to us whenever we had like a free break, she would get the book out. So it was really smart on her part because mm -hmm. <laughs> she would get us quiet. But she read us A Wrinkle in Time. And I just remember it was about these two siblings that like travel to space to find their lost father. So it was really, really I don't know, fascinating. So that's yeah. what, really one of the first times that I thought like, hey, books can be fun because before that they were always school books. So hopefully your kids will learn they can be fun a little earlier than that. Right. I read a book in high school um, and it was a requirement to read. It was East of Eden by John Steinbeck. And it was the first time I remember in my high school career that I actually loved a requirement for reading. Um, it was a page turner for me and I've read it actually a few times since, but as an you know older school age child, that was the first one that I was like, oh, I can enjoy reading during school. All right, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. So let's talk about some of those benefits of reading. Science has actually shown that reading has great health benefits. It helps with depression, can improve the sleep quality and reducing stress from your kids or from you. Keeping your brain active through reading has even been linked to longevity. So when we read, we not only improve our memory and our empathy, but we also end up feeling better and oftentimes more positive. Uh, some other benefits, it helps our kids deepen their knowledge of themselves, their beliefs, their values, and their dreams as they read these things and they can kind of compare themselves. It allows kids to slip into the lives of others, gaining insights into other people and developing their sense of compassion and empathy. It helps kids learn to th and to think about moral and social issues. It can aid students in finding solutions to their own problems. It also helps to develop their imagination and nurtures creativity. And of course, it entertains and can relax is an effective way to learn to deal with certain situations. So our military teens constantly have to leave places, as Sarah's family get ready to do now, and people that they love. And reading oftentimes about a similar situation could help them realize how other teens approach similar challenges and feelings. So... There's just things that they can learn through reading that things that they have gone through or they are going through, somebody else has already gone through. So there are many academic benefits of reading. Reading helps develop uh, the critical and logical thinking skills. It increases reading fluency and comprehension and builds vocabulary. Research has shown a definite connection between a child's vocabulary size and how well they comprehend what they read. So a good vocabulary will help them not only in high school, like assessments, SATs, you know, but also throughout their career. Um, higher test scores have been shown in language arts and other subjects. Again, think about the SATs and the ACTs. They're comprehending those questions better. Research found that students who chose to read for pleasure, of course, perform better in English, but also math, science, and history. So it also helps with their writing, grammar, and spelling, which makes sense, right? They're seeing, they're reading it, they're seeing it, they're absorbing the correct way to do all of those things. Reading over the summer also helps with preventing the summer learning loss, sometimes called the summer slide. This term refers to the loss of knowledge gained in the school year during the summer break, especially in reading and math. That's often the two that get hurt the most. So reading out of the summer can help our military connected students who are moving um, keep up with their reading skills. Reading improves focus and concentration. So the longer you stay engaged in a book, the more you're rewarded for being focused. So that's how that can kind of come about. And then of course they gain confidence when they're speaking. This is especially true when they're reading aloud. Think back to those days in the class when you were asked to read aloud in class, right? One of the single most feared classroom activities for many. If you're reading aloud at home, it makes it definitely gives you more confidence to be that read aloud in school person. So if you are the parent 
of a middle or high schooler, then you're probably a parent of a Generation Z. The Pew Research Center describes this age group as anyone born after 1997. I have one. While there is not a set date for this generation, as of 2023, the oldest members are 26 years old and the youngest will turn 12 this year. So this generation is also known as the Gen Z, digital natives, or the I generation. And it's the first truly digital native generation. They've lived their lives fully connected digitally. They are growing up in a time of global access to streaming content and social media. And this can actually be a positive asset to our military students who have had the opportunity to stay connected to a parent who might be gone, TDY, uh, an extended family member, you know, out in another state, or even friends that they've they connected with from a previous duty station. So understanding some of the characteristics of this generation can help us understand their worldviews, their interests, and their preferred ways of learning. So parents can and just may have to reevaluate the way they're supporting their students' learning. So let's look at some uh, reading habits of this generation. In the past decade, there have been a steady decline in reading for pleasure. Probably not a surprise. Despite the ease of access, people today are reading less compared to past generations. Less than 20% of US teens report reading for pleasure versus 80% or more right, say they're using social media every day. So that's you know the poll. Our elementary students ages five to 11 typically have what sustained silent reading, SSR, in the classroom as part of their daily activity. However, this practice often ends during middle and high school as their focus turns towards the social media, online websites, and video games in their free time. So if you look at the, um, the graph, you see that 33% of tweens, we're talking eight to 12 year olds, say that they read for fun at least once a week versus only 24% of our teens 13 to 18 year old. 33% of tweens, they really like reading, but only 24% of teens. 34% of tweens claim to be daily readers, only 21% of our teens. A few statistics that aren't on the graph is 12% of tweens say they read less than once a month. So that's kind of sad, but 20% of our teens say they read less than once a month, and 18% of our teens say they never read for pleasure. So we need to work on that percentage and mo moving that up. Sarah? Yeah, those are some hard numbers to hear, Michelle. It is so reading for, reading for pleasure during the teenage years, like we saw, has become increasingly challenging. And some of those reasons are that teens' lives have become increasingly digital. So our teenagers use an average of seven and a half hours of entertainment screen media per day. Our books then are competing with a compelling lure of that social media, those video games, screen media, and the schoolwork for the teens' time. In many cases, students become more involved in extracurricular activities as well, so that means less time for reading. Um, and then during those high school years, students are required to do more volunteer hours. And in some cases, they begin to work. So a summer job might be taking up a lot of that spare time they have to read, um, whether that's maybe they're working retail or they're babysitting or they're mowing lawns. I do have an engagement question for you in the chat box. The question is, what are some of the changes in reading habits you've noticed in your children from elementary to middle or middle to high school? One of the things I remember as a kid because I don't have middle school or high school age students, is that it changed from reading for pleasure um, during those elementary years uh, to reading to learn in those middle and high school years. I just took less time to really enjoy reading when I was older than I did when I was in elementary school. Yeah, yeah, you um, just, they don't have the time. And I, I, will, I will tell you that my kids, even though they, they both did find time to read, it definitely, they didn't have the free time that they did before. Right. And living this military lifestyle, we know that our military families are often moving during the summer, and this interrupts those family routines, those bedtime routines, the dinner routines, um, the extracurricular routines. And this also means that they are 
um, those reading routines are, you know, needing to be readjusted as well. So if you have a teenager that's already into a specific series or a book and they have a whole routine over this reading, um, this habit they have um, during those summer moves, that routine is again, term topsy turvy and um, your child might have a lack of motiv motivation, you know, to get back into those reading habits. Um, we'll discuss a little later some ideas um, to keep your adolescents reading and to overcome some of those military challenges that they see. Um, so if you move on, every person needs a reason to read, right? So teens mainly do it for two reasons. The first one is because they have to. Um, it's either a part of their schoolwork, for example. They are completing a summer assignment. Um, and unless they're in summer school or they have designated summer assignments, um, this one goes away during summer break. The second reason is because they want to. It's for pleasure, they're curious about a particular subject or a theme, and they use it to maybe escape the everyday life. Whatever the reason is, teens must build up their fluency and their comprehension to learn and enjoy reading successfully. So if we look at some strategies to build that fluency and the comprehension skills, the first and foremost is to read daily and routinely. Parents frequently ask, how long should teenagers read per day? The Renaissance learning suggests that at least 15 minutes per day appears to be that magic number. Students who read 15 minutes or more a day saw accelerated reading gains in assessments. That means gains higher than the national average. And students who read just over a half hour to an hour per day saw the most significant improvements. So this can be reading for pleasure or reading a textbook. Unfortunately, for those teens, this does not include reading texts. All right. Additionally, let them choose. So one way to get our kids to enjoy reading is to let them choose what they want to read. While you may cringe at their preferences, they may never touch a title if it's force fed. So if you don't know where to start, maybe ask the teacher or the librarian or check online like Scholastic or Common Sense Media for recommendations. I really love Common Sense Media because it offers information from books and movies to games and apps. On this website, they evaluate books and they provide a general overview along with recommended age for each title. This is specifically useful um, for parents who aren't familiar with a book or are looking for ideas to pique their students' interests. Um, Additionally, you can help them choose the right book. Scholastic reports that four in 10 kids agree to having trouble finding books they like. And this is far higher than a 59% among infrequent readers. It's not only that kids read about subjects they're interested in, but they also pick books that are just right. So the question is, what is a just right book? A just right book is a book your child can read almost perfectly without help. So your child should be able to read at least 95% or more of the words correctly for a book to be considered just right. Books that are too easy can make reading boring, while those that are too difficult can make it very frustrating. And your student may skip around parts and fail to understand what's really happening. So remember, you are your child's best advocate and their biggest cheerleader. So work with them to select a just right book. When we match the just right book with a book they're interested in, we can nurture their love for reading and for books. So one way to figure out if the book is a just right book is to have them open the book, read a page and see if it's too difficult. So in the chat box, I have a couple links for you, Common Sense Media being the first one, um, and then also some popular books for teens and tweens. Feel free to check those out. Michelle? Okay, thank you. So let's look at some more strategies to build fluency and comprehension. We talked a little bit earlier about reading aloud. So we actually have another poll for you. And so we would like feedback about, about your, your family. Does your family read aloud together? Yes, no, or when my kids were little, or why I never thought about reading aloud with teenagers. I will say uh, I did when my kids were little, but I did never think about reading aloud <laughs> with teenagers. So there, I, I admitted that one. So um, thank you for think, just, you know, go ahead and think about that. Uh, so many parents think that as soon as their kids learn to read independently, they no longer need to be read to, but kids can still benefit from it as they hear the rhythm of the language while learning the correct 
pronunciation. And I do remember my daughter, um, when she would read a lot on her Kindle, and um, she could look up the meaning of a word on the Kindle if she had, but the pronunciation, at least at that time, was not there. So they knew a lot of words, but they didn't know how to say them. So I do see where reading aloud definitely, you know, is, is helpful. According to greatschools.org, reading aloud is an advertisement for books. So, you know, it's obviously a positive thing. Research shows that it's not until the eighth grade that students' reading level catches up to their listening level. So until that time, most students were capable of hearing, understanding, and enjoying material that was more complicated than what they could read. So you can actually read, you know, at levels above their reading levels to them, and they might find that more interesting and more exciting. So reading aloud can increase a child's vocabulary, often adding more rich and advanced language that isn't heard in a normal everyday conversation. When reading aloud, children can also share their thoughts, they can ask questions, and they can relate to what they're reading um, to maybe real life situations that they've dealt with or dealing with. Or they can connect the book to their life experience. For example, when a military family moves to a new duty location, it can be an excellent opportunity to read books or information about that new location or maybe a new culture if they're moving overseas. So students could try those nonfiction books to learn about space, coding, you know, photography, travel, whatever their interest is, right? Don't forget to introduce them to books that you love when you are their age. They may not like them, but you can certainly introduce them and hopefully maybe they will. Parents can check for comprehension if they're reading aloud and ask them to reread if, if they need to. And if teens are resistant to reading aloud, the other option, maybe not quite as good, are audiobooks because they're still being read to, they're hearing it, um, and they're hearing the pronunciation. So a parent in one of our on in-person workshops shared that her family picks a story together, a, a, an audiobook, and then an actual book, and then everyone takes turns reading that chapter out loud. So this family activity incorporates kids of all the ages and builds that quality family time. And we will talk about audiobooks a little bit later. <laughs> so, so let's talk about family activities. They also can encourage reading and build fluency and comprehension skills. So some of the things you could do, visit the library. Try and make it an event where you share some quality time and choose a few new books. Make it part of your routine. Model reading. So according to Scholastic's Kids and Family Reading Report, frequent readers are actually more likely to be surrounded by people they perceive to enjoy reading. So 82% say a lot or nearly everyone they know enjoys reading versus infrequent readers who say, well, maybe 30 some percent that they know enjoys reading. So we welcome you to continue that model reading. We, we would highly recommend it. Middle and high schoolers will still follow your reading habits. Let them see you reading, let, make comments, maybe share some exciting passages with your team. You may even want to read some of the same young adult books yourself. Some of them are actually very, very good. So you could have books discussions. Parents and teens, again, can maybe choose the same book. Each gets a copy and they read a chapter a week and then they discuss it. This idea could be especially helpful and a wonderful idea during deployments or family separation. Military connected teenagers can read the same book as the deployed parent and then schedule those video calls to discuss the book. This activity can help students build those reading comprehension skills and of course strengthen that parent-child relationships. I'm not sure how many of you have been in that situation, but sometimes when that phone rings, the, the kids don't always know what to say. So what a great kind of go-to to get started. And then there's United Through Reading, which connects military families who are separated by providing that bonding experience of shared reading. They have a free app and a um, yeah, a free app and then a website. And, and Sarah will share that in the chat box. So how can we build that love of reading? Here are some suggestions on how to inspire it. First, parents should focus on how on their children having access 
to books. As we mentioned earlier, reading habits have changed. Therefore, as parents, we need to adapt and be open to newer ways of reading. And many of us are used to holding a book, but our children are very used to reading off of a screen. So connect to reading to your teen's use of technology. So download books on a tablet or an e-reader. The electronic format has proved to be especially engaging for those boys or maybe those reluctant readers. So plus it's a great way to take multiple books on vacation without all of that extra weight. Your local libraries and base libraries offer free downloads. So be sure your family is taking advantage of these benefits. There's a Libby app that allows you to borrow free eBooks and digital downloads and magazines from your local library. And all you need is a library card. And that link is in the chat box as well as the link for the MWR digital libraries. You may wanna consider, this is what we're talking about, audiobooks. Children have reported that audiobooks have sparked their interest in reading more about a topic. Public libraries offer vast number of audiobooks. So if you're heading out on vacation or back and forth from school activities, they can start listening to a novel that appeals to them. Audiobooks can be a great option. Also when military families travel um, to see maybe extended family or on that long PCS drive to your next duty station. Um, a, new, a military spouse told us that her oldest son is now attending college in New York and the rest of the family stationed in South Carolina. So she mentioned that one of their favorite activities is to have them all listen to a book in the car while they're driving. Helps take up that time in there and they are having a little bonding experience. According to Scholastic Reading Report, frequent readers ages six through 17 have an average of 139 books in their homes versus 74 in infrequent reader homes. So make sure you your children have access to books, ebooks, and other different forms of reading. Books can be expensive, we know, so visit your library. Maybe look, search out yard sales, thrift stores, or maybe start a book exchange between your child and their friends. And I will say my daughter did this in middle school and it was very organized. They all had their own little books and who they sent it out to, And but it, it kept us from having to buy so many new books. <laughs> uh, does your child have a favorite movie or a series? So read the book first, if possible, and then have a family night to watch the film together. Ask questions like, who do you think should play the part of the main character in the movie you know, if it hadn't been out yet? And what parts of the story would you include in the movie? If you've ever watched a movie versus a book, the book has a lot more right detail than the movie. And how would you change the book if you were a writer? And don't count out the classics. Books are called classics because they continue to engage readers generation after generation. There are no guarantees, but you could try introducing your kids to books, again, that you loved Epic as a kid and see if they like them. Some of the good ones are, I'm trying to think, The Giver. Um, actually, The Hunger Games is now considered a classic, <laughs> which, which our kids did read and definitely need a little bit of parental supervision at the time. <laughs> But what a good, very engaging series. Uh, and again, don't be open to different genres. Kids go through phases of genres that they're passionate about, from those nonfiction, learning about animals, maybe to science fiction and fantasy. So don't get hung up on whether it's considered great literature, although some of them are. Uh, be happy that your teen is devouring those books one after the other. So again, some of those might be the Hunger Games, The Giver, The Hobbit, um, The Outsiders. And then Sarah, you mentioned one earlier that you read. I love the Spiderwick Chronicles when oh, I was. There you go. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, uh, there's so many out there. So even it might not be your favorite, it may be something that they're interested in. And then once, sometimes teenagers will find an author that they love the way they write. And they want to read all of their books. So this is a great excuse for a trip to the library or that opportunity for book swapping among friends. If they like an author, look for additional books along that line. Some of the good bets for favorites are like the Spider Brick Chronicles that she talked about. Um, Sherlock Holmes. James Patterson has actually written quite a few young adult books. And we all know what a good author that he is. 
Um, so yeah, there's so many. Rick Rorden, J.K. Rowling's. I'm trying to think. There's too many, too many to note it, to to note them all. But we are sharing some great links for you with a lot of those in there. So in the end, you'll want to find books about things that your child loves. So a Scholastic Kids Reading Study noted that 12 to 17 year olds want to read books about, but not in the order of priority, things that make them laugh, things that let them use their imagination, things that contain a mystery to solve, things that have books that have a character that they can emulate, a book that teaches them something new, uh, and I, I would say maybe top of the list is a book that lets them forget about real life for a while. So anything that they're reading is going to take them away, right? So United Through Reading, which we mentioned before, and the Library of Congress offer great lists of recommended books by age. And those links are in the chat box. Also, consider subscribing to or checking out library magazines that interest your, your children. Newspapers also cover topics of interest. It's also a great ability to talk about those social and moral issues that may come up when you're reading about current events. And of course, many of those can also be found online. So you don't have to get the hard copy magazine or newspaper. And then change up their reading space. You know, go outside. I know hammocks were popular for a while, maybe a comfy lounger on the deck. I know our kids used to climb up in a small tree house that we had, you know, just a new exciting place to read. We talked about libraries before, but we want to remind you to look for those local summer reading programs. These often include contests and prizes that are awarded to those that read a certain number of books. Uh, check out, don't forget the MWR Post Libraries. And then this, this summer, there's an I Read program at, uh, at the, I guess they're all the libraries, but to include the MWR libraries. And we have that link in the chat box. We want you to know, and, and if your child is struggling or appears bored with a book, unless it's schoolwork, don't make them finish it. Forcing them to stick with a difficult or a dull book intended for pleasure is going to reinforce that reading is a chore. So we want them to think of reading as a pleasure. Sarah? Yeah, and I think one thing we didn't mention in that whole list was graphic novels and those being uh, still, even though they're, you know, very um, image-based, they're still full of text and they also have complex plots and characters and conflicts. And if your child is into graphic novels, then that is still um, a great option for them to continue reading. All right. So Thank all you. reading counts. Yeah. Whether it's articles or topics that interest them. Um, we talked about the advantages to online reading, like lots of books on the tablet. There's free downloads. There's a ton of different choices. However, recent research suggests that we use different parts of the brain when we're reading from a piece of paper versus a screen. So reading from a screen is called non-linear reading. It's a practice that involves skimming a screen and having your eyes dart around a web page or getting distracted by pop-ups. You reap most of the benefits of learning from engaging in deep reading. That's linear reading. This is how children learn to read from the beginning. They open a book and they start at the top and they read down and it involves multiple senses. The touching of the book, feeling it, seeing the book. Um, and it also shows that it increases the retention and the comprehension. So parents should encourage their students to take on both kinds of reading as each of their, as each has their own benefit. Linear reading on paper allows for that deep reading while reading non-linearly is good for them to quickly skim through articles to locate resources or to read books for leisure. So how can you incorporate linear reading into your child's summer? Think outside the box as parents. We're always doing this anyway. You could play games that utilize reading, possibly a crossword puzzle. This provides opportunities for learning new words and spelling practice too. Um, you could help them find a recipe online or in a cookbook. And most board games incorporate reading in their play in some way. Also think about incorporating writing. Whether you're using snail mail or emailing, encourage your military child to keep in touch with those distant friends or relatives. You could keep a personal journal or maybe even have them journal about special events. This will inadvertently have them practice reading. Um, you could potentially have an incentive. So for some students, an incentive would be to publish a book review 
when your student finishes a book, encourage them to write it up for maybe a family newsletter, a school newspaper, a magazine, or a website. And they could also try posting these reviews at a local bookseller or maybe an online um, retailer. Additionally, you could have your middle or your high schooler read a book to your younger child. I'm so looking forward to this opportunity when my child is old enough. If you have a younger sibling, let them take over reading, or an older sibling, I'm sorry, let them take over that reading at bedtime once a week. They might find that the younger child's enthusiasm for stories is contagious, and the older sibling can also pass along that love of learning. At MSAC, we say it in and out, do routine things routinely. So consider making reading part of that family routine. For example, every everyone reads on Sunday night for 30 minutes, or even better, make or keep reading part of that bedtime routine every night. Um, I have an engagement question for you. Can you share with us any ways that you have been able to inspire linear reading, that's reading from paper, in your children? You can add that to the chat box at any time. I don't know about inspire, but I think there's certain books that my kids only want to read in, in hardback. I, I, I know that... Um, We've had to purchase several of the Harry Potter series books numerous times because they get so worn, <laughs> but they really enjoy reading them over and over again. I think Rick Rorden's series is another one that they've read, but they only mm -hmm. want to read it, the book version. So for whatever reason, I think it takes them back. Yeah. Makes them feel I younger again. Less also care, kind of have, <laughs> yeah, also having that hard car hardcover copy of a book and being able to set it on the shelf. It's like a trophy for me, at least I have this, it's like, good I like being able to see all the books I read right there on the um, shelf. <laughs> so I have a video for you and it talks about some suggestions to help those reluctant readers. <laughs> So let's look at the role of social media. And I have a chat box question for you. Imagine that you're a military family and you just received orders to relocate and you need recommendations recommendations for housing. Where's the first place that you ask for recommendations and insights? And I lived this a couple months ago. We got orders to California. We are in South Carolina right now. So on the other side of the United States. And the first place I went to is good old Facebook. So just like... Um, adults, teenagers look for recommendations and they find these on social media. Some of the most common for teenagers are to go to YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. If there's a celebrity influencer that they're particularly interested, they may have a significant impact on your teen's preferences. Like I said, just like adults, teenagers are most likely to read something that their peers or friends are also reading. So make sure you check into um, what their friends are reading. 
And if your middle or high schooler has access to social media platforms, consider following or friending them so you can see who they are actually following. Parents can also share valuable social media content and recommendations with their teenagers. Um, and we do have another video for you. It's called Book Recommendations Episode 1. And this, we, we know that today's connected teens are heavily influenced by the peers that they're um, with all the time. And they're reading what they've their peers have read before. So peers have always had a big influence. However, with social media now, that peer group has grown tremendously. So we are going to watch a video of a teen influencer recommending books to other teens. Hi guys, it's Nicole and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be filming a book recommendations video. If someone told me at the beginning of this year that I was going to be filming and posting a book video on my YouTube channel, I would not believe them for one second. And let me just elaborate. I feel like I never really enjoyed reading growing up. Like, I love the Pinkalicious books. Those were bomb. But I didn't read for pleasure. Like, I wouldn't go out of my way, pick up a book, and be like, all right, let's read. So, this new hobby of mine, it came out of nowhere. It was so unexpected, but I freaking love it. I will admit, I've become a bookworm. <laughs> so, in this video, I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in August. How I feel about them. Do I recommend them or not? If you can see, this top shelf are 15 books. I read all of them in August. There aren't going to be any any spoilers in this video i'm just gonna give you guys a quick synopsis of the books just to see if you're interested in them you know i obviously don't want to tell you what happens in the book like too much of it i want you guys to see if you're interested and see if you want the book yourself i will say right now though i genuinely enjoyed all of them there were definitely some that i gave only four out of five stars but there were also some that i gave five out of five so i'm gonna let you guys know but i truly enjoyed them all so there weren't any books that were like oh no don't get this just to let you know before we get started most of them are romance novels romance is definitely my favorite genre but then there are also some like murder mysteries which are very interesting too but i just wanted to let you guys know a good amount of them in this video are romance all right so if you are a reader or if you're not i hope you guys enjoy this video me sitting down with y'all and chatting all right i love this video of a teen recommending her favorite books um, because it makes it okay for teens to love books and to be the bookworm that she described. We know that teens are constantly struggling with that identity crisis um, at their age. So having one of their peers actually say that, oh, they're a bookworm too, and they're interested in X, Y, and Z, it gives them you know, the okay to be one as well. It's interesting to note, though, that only 21% of boys 8 to 18 years said that their favorite media activity was reading versus 60% who said that video games um, were their favorite. So how can we get more boys reading? Um, um, we have a video for you. It's a great example of a young male influencer recommending his top five books. It often happens that you start reading a book, but you're unable to finish it. Therefore, you're supposed to start reading the right books that will help you build up your reading habits. So, in today's video, I'm going to be telling you guys the five books that 10 year olds should start reading. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's jump right into the video. Finally. Let's start with the first book, And the Mountains Echoed. I have spent many years reading books and what I think about them is that they get boring using irrelevant information, but this book, nah, you can forget about that. This book never gets boring. If there is a fun scene or an action or adventure scene, they just keep on going. And this book is about simple and little things about life, that's why it never ever gets boring. Number two is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. This book boosts your imagination to a whole new level. I mean, imagine opening your closet door and entering a whole new world. Into the and in this world, there is stuff that not even mankind can imagine. If you're a 10 year old out there and you like creating your own fantasies, mark my words, you will finish this book. Number three is the Diary of a Wimpy Kid series. If there is a 10 year old kid out there and he is really interested in reading books, then I recommend that he should start reading this book because it is written in easy language 
and it's really illustrative. I still read this book and I still find it amusing. Uh huh, sure. Book number four is Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Kids have always been craving sweets and if you open this book to any page, you will feel as though there is a chocolate tsunami whooshing towards you. At least that's how I felt. But it's really fun to read because you really get to understand the characters really well because it's not from anyone's perspective and I really like it that way. But this book has also very very small lessons that young students can learn, including me. The fifth and final book is The Almanac. This book is an overdose of science, of general knowledge, and of animal kingdoms. I mean, who would not want to learn about the cool stuff that the world already has, and you don't even know about it? Did you know that there isn't any flat surface to walk on on Saturn? You need to know this before you get selected for NASA. A reflection question for you all. Do you think that your teen would read a book recommended by any of their, their favorite bloggers over your own personal book recommendations? I know that if Ruby and Bonnie or Salish and Yidal recommended a book to my kindergartner, they, she would jump all over it compared to if I recommended the same exact book. Um, so rather than waiting for recommendations to filter in from more traditional publicity sources, preteens and teens can now recommend books peer-to-peer -peer using their channels to rate, review, and share their love of their latest reads. TikTok and Instagram have led to an explosion of recommendations via social media movements such as Bookstagram, BookTok, and BookTube. Goodreads is also a pop popular site for readers and book recommendations that allow users to see what books they are reading. Goodread books offer a limited number of giveaways um, of the first book in a series. So this, for example, during the first week of May, they shared a book titled Spin of Fate, and it was full of magical beasts and fantasy. And again, they gave away a certain number of that first set for free. So I'm going to put those in your chat box. Um, and I also love the idea of having these vlogs and these um, recommendations for your child because as a parent it helps you to limit what or I guess uh, view what they're on um, rather than them just you know traveling all over the internet Michelle we know those challenges that come with that all right yeah, I think I think that he did a really good job uh, enticing boys to read he did a, a great job adding his own little flair to that I thought that was really cute so Let's get back to those reading assignments. We mentioned earlier that one reason that teenagers read during the summer is because they have to. So remember that it's a required part of um, reading for a lot of schools that they finish a book before they go back in the fall. Um, so middle and high school students may have to read content that they are not interested in, but it's still part of their assignment. So here are some ideas to help with those assigned readings when your child is struggling or just you know doesn't want to read those reading assignments. So again, we talked about reading aloud. So read with your team, especially your younger team. So you can read one page, they can read the next page or chapter, chapter, however it works best for you, but give you a chance to talk about the content and ask questions so that you're ensured that they're actually understanding and comprehending what they're reading. And then um, sometimes you'll know if they have to reread if they're not quite getting it. And then when they're reading, listen to them. It helps children that they have an audience um, to explain what they're reading, kind of teach it back to you. Having them read aloud also gives you insight if they're having any trouble reading. It's an essential strategy for improving our middle school and high school reading comprehension uh, to make the connections between their personal lives and the material that they're reading. So sometimes that boring assignment can suddenly become very interesting if they find they can relate to something in the text. They can understand how things are affecting that person and how it might affect them. You might help them divide the reading assignment into manageable sections, depending upon how big. You don't want them to sit down the night before and read that book before they go to class. 
You can help limit distractions while they're reading, during their reading time, you know, put the phones away, encourage them to take notes along the way. Taking notes engages like another section of the brain and it makes reading more interesting and it helps that material stick for when they go back in the fall. And don't forget to take those short breaks to ward off frustration. Some fresh air or, you know, get maybe a little snack or play a game that can work wonders to energize them for when they have to get back involved. So there's just a few ideas. Um, and we want to share a webinar that uh, MSEC has. It's a recorded webinar called Tackling Homework Help for Military Families. And that can also maybe give you some more broad general ideas on how to help with homework. And then we'll also share the MSIC webinar library if you want to be curious and look at all the other recorded webinars that MSIC, MSIC has. So let's look at some reading challenges. As students move up in grades, their teachers typically assign more and more reading, like reading a textbook, chapter, or novels. So occasionally our children can mask reading difficulties well, and they don't they don't surface until they're in middle school or they begin tackling these longer reading assignments. I do know that happened to a friend of mine who discovered her daughter was dyslexic in middle school. No issues before, great student. Um, side note, she's now finished college, has a wonderful career as a photojournalist, so she made it out. But it was such a, an eye-opening thing for them to realize how she was struggling in middle school. So we wanna stress if you find that your child struggles for whatever reason, with any aspect of reading comprehension or fluency, um, we do want you to discuss this with the teacher, a counselor, or even your physician. You wanna ask teachers what you can do at home to help your child. Maybe there's some things you can do. Some schools provide instructional intervention as specific programs to address academic need. Your child might even qualify to receive help from a reading specialist or a speech and language therapist or other services in the fall. We're going to share two uh, resources for you. Re Response to Intervention, which <clears throat> is a program that aims to identify and provide support to those children, and Military One Source, which offers educational intervention programs as well. So the earlier a reading challenge is addressed, the better. Because if a child doesn't feel successful or they're struggling, they just will resist reading. So as we wrap up our webinar today, we wanna to emphasize that we live in a time when teenagers' reading habits have changed. What has not changed is the importance of the parents' role in engaging and fostering the love of reading. So understanding this new digital era, be supportive and be a positive role model and be open to locating and offering those new opportunities and new approaches to inspire your middle and high school kids to read. So we wanna thank you again for joining today's webinar. We wanna invite you to take that survey we mentioned in the beginning of the webinar. You can do that by clicking on the survey link in the chat box, or you can use the QR code on the screen. You'll have to add the webinar number 5824 that's specific to this webinar and be sure to hit submit at the end of the survey. <clears throat> we do use this tool to make ongoing improvements to our webinar series um, so and we provide feedback to our funders so we really do appreciate it if you take the time to complete the survey. If you missed one of our previous webinars or maybe you'll want to view it again you would like to share this session, the recording can be found on our website, militarychild.org, and the link is in the chat box. And if you haven't already heard about it, we invite you and encourage you to check out SchoolQuest. It is an online interactive tool that is specifically designed to support highly mobile military families and students. It is full of free resources, tips to help students achieve academic success and well-being. And again, it's totally free. It is not limited to military families. So if you are aware of a family that is mobile, it's wonderful. You can share that with them and check that out. 
Do you have any questions, concerns, or educational related issues for your military connected child or children that you work with? Our military student consultants are the premier source to help you with all of those questions. Um, they are also a free service and they do an excellent job. So their contact information is also in the chat box. The Military Child Wellbeing Toolkit was developed for parents, school professionals, behavioral mental health professionals, and community leaders. And this tool, again, free, is full of resources for all aspects of our military connected children's well-being. And we would love for you to explore it on our website and again, share it with others. Uh, our MSEC 360 summits provide opportunities for cross-sector collaboration, idea sharing, and programming support. So for more information, use that QR code you see on the screen or click on the link in the chat box. Uh, uh, our MSEC Global Training Summit is now uh, open for registration. It will be July 24th through the 26th in Washington, DC. And gosh, we encourage you to go, but it's for anybody who serves and supports our uh, the educational needs of our military and veteran connected children. And that link is in the chat box. If you're interested in getting a certificate of completion, please complete that online survey. Um, but if you want a survey for a, a, a one that you might watch a recording, please contact research at militarychild.org and they can get that for you as well. We have some wonderful webinars coming up. Um, but tomorrow is when the when a parent leaves the military. There's a number of way, of reasons a parent leaves the military. So that's a really good one uh, to think about all the different aspects. And then next week on Tuesday, persistent and challenging behaviors, how to deal with them, uh, ways to avoid them. Uh, and we would, the, both the links for those are in the registration links are in the chat box. So we want to, again, give a special thanks to the Navy Child and Youth Program for making today's webinar possible. We'd also like to thank you for taking your time and attending this workshop so that you can better support our incredible military-connected children. Thank you very much.